Sridhar and uh, Srinivas for this opportunity. The objective of this presentation would be to sensitize you to think beyond sepsis. And uh, uh, it is rightly said that if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. And how true it is when it comes to newborns where all uh, unwell newborns are taken to be septic unless proved otherwise. And in fact, we also ask for a septic screen, thinking that the newborn is already septic and the onus is on the newborn to prove his or her innocence. So let me illustrate by some case studies, uh, the cases that gave us a clue as when we thought uh, that we are looking beyond sepsis. This was a 12 day old baby, a 2.5 kg uh, birth weight who was admitted for respiratory distress. And the mother used to say the baby does not feed well, but otherwise uh, had been exclusively breastfed. And obviously with respiratory distress, feeding difficulty, we took a clinical diagnosis of sepsis uh, with a chest infection in the form of pneumonia, uh, stabilized the baby, started on uh, IV antibiotics and with a uh, little oxygen, the baby stabilized. The sepsis screen uh, was uh, way and uh, what was unusual here was that his baby had a past history of hospitalization for five days at the time of birth, sometimes uh, during the end of the first day with a similar diagnosis of pneumonia. So we said uh, nothing uh, wrong with that. And uh, uh, what also confirmed was there was a right upper lobe uh, pneumonia in this baby. And we were happy that we made a diagnosis of pneumonia. Now. The point here is why does a newborn, or for that matter, any individual develop a second episode of pneumonia? And it was obvious that there was something wrong and we were missing on the underlying cause. And it is said that when you don't understand uh, what is exactly going wrong, I recollect our teacher telling us, go back and have a look uh, head to toe at the newborn or for that matter, any uh, of such uh, cases. And obviously when we opened the mouth, there was an isolated cleft palate uh, involving the hard palate from which an aspiration was taking place, causing this baby to develop a second episode of pneumonia. Otherwise, we would have just said this is a pneumonia and the baby would have come time again and again and uh, we would have missed on this underlying anatomical malformation which predisposed this newborn to develop pneumonia. So what did we learn? That history is not history. Uh, if you listen to the parents, what they are trying to tell us is uh, going to give you a clue. And when in doubt, when things don't fit in, uh, you must do a head to toe examination. And the basics always seem to give us a clue also in this advanced age of technical or technology dependent newborn care. Well, this was another baby who on day 25 had feeding difficulty and noisy breathing. The baby otherwise was well. And uh, the mother said that uh, there used to be recurrent nasal discharge. On admission, the baby's vitals were stable. The oxygen saturations were good. There were no features to suggest a uh, possibility of a heart disease. And uh, we were wondering what was happening. And 12 hours, 24 hours down the line, the baby appeared to be well. So we said, we'll feed the baby. And uh, uh, the nurse attempted to put a nasogastric tube. There was a lot of frothing, gurgling. There were worsening of the respiratory distress and the baby crash becoming extremely blue. The nurse panicked and called up the attendant uh, on call. Uh, by the time he reached, the nurse had pulled out the tube and uh, did a suction only to find that uh, when the doctor came, the baby was vigorous and crying. So what was happening here is that something predisposed or uh, precipitated this baby to go almost into a apparent life-threatening episode. But if you find the sequence of events, and if you again look at what was the way by which the baby presented, A, absence of risk factors for sepsis, B, an unusual complaint, that of recurrent nasal discharge. What was happening here was when the nurse put in a nasogastric tube, there was a membranous, uh, what you can say, in unilateral coenal atresia, membranous variety. So uh, when you put in a tube, the only breathing uh, nostril gets blocked. The baby becomes blue and when you remove the tube out, the baby starts breathing and that's how you had this apparent light threatening episode secondary to an underlying malformation, which again was there giving us a clue in the form of history and therefore again, uh, 
wherever things happen uh, wrong, please go back to the history and try to say uh, what are the predisposing factors that we have in this case. Another baby on day five came with repeated episodes of vomiting of 12 hours duration. The vomitings were clear, but the baby was not feeding. So we said, uh, this is quite unusual. We'll, uh, but things don't appear to be otherwise that terribly wrong. There were no risk factors. It was an uneventful delivery. Baby was being breastfed and per abdomen examination was normal. A sepsis screen was done, which was negative. However, there was a little unusual uh, thing was there was fullness of the epigastrium, which was noticed. So we said, why not keep the baby under observation? And uh, what we found was over the next uh, 12 hours, the baby uh, apparently had a clear fullness, which became uh, more prominent and uh, an X-ray confirmed almost to say uh, with an ultrasound showing that it was a mal rotation which was setting in. And it is not unusual, therefore, for a mimic of sepsis-like condition in the form of mal rotation and abdominal pathology, which uh, initially presents with non-bilious vomiting, a high index of suspicion is required, and you allow the baby to uh, proceed further, it ends up with a bilious vomiting, and by that time, probably, we have uh, got the baby in not a good shape. So uh, any GI pathology, or for that matter, any unexplained worsening, uh, one would think in terms of an underlying uh, malrotation kind of uh, pathology. This was another baby, day seven, uh, who came with poor feeding of last few hours duration. The baby was obviously quite cold, drowsy, delayed capillary fill time, a low blood pressure, and a diagnosis of shock was made. Obviously, uh, there was no history to suggest a previous uh, risk factor. There was no murmur, no organomegaly, no features to suggest a congenital heart defect. So we had a baby with septic shock as our clinical diagnosis. Uh, except for a low sodium and high potassium, the baby apparently was well. Now, the point here is that uh, uh, something that was amiss here was that, again, uh, no risk factors, deterioration happening in this baby, and the clue came here from the low sodium and high potassium, which we know is suggesting an adrenal pathology. And time and again, a congenital adrenal hyperplasia starts manifesting sometimes towards the end of second, uh, towards the end of first week. And uh, many of these will come only with shock without a risk factor. And uh, the clue here is a low sodium and a high potassium. And you would be uh, lucky enough if you find that there are uh, ambiguous genitalia, but that is not the rule. But a low sodium and a high potassium is a clue to you to say that this is an adrenal pathology. This was another baby, 2.1 kg term, obviously an IUGR who had developed uh, a hypoglycemia for which uh, umbilical line was placed and was on quite high uh, glucose infusion rate. Sometimes down the line during the course, on day four of the hospitalization, the baby started developing failure, poor capillary refill time, and quickly deteriorated uh, and developed almost a cardiorespiratory arrest. Now, why should a baby on day four of hospitalization, being otherwise doing well, having stable sugars, uh, deteriorate? And the baby needed uh, to be intubated and uh, uh, fluid bolus, epinephrine, and uh, a possibility of underlying heart disease was suspected and a prostaglandin drip was also started. A bedside test confirmed that this was not what otherwise appeared to be a acute deterioration because of uh, septic shock. And in fact, it was a malpositioned catheter which triggered this episode. And what did we learn from last three cases? That if we have an abrupt deterioration, think beyond sepsis, a structural cause or an anatomical cause is quite common, if not a metabolic cause in the form of an endocrine disorder, and last but not the least. Is it that something that we are doing or some interventions that we are doing themselves are causing the baby to deteriorate and an iatrogenic disorder is always to be kept in the back of mind in such situations. Acute deterioration is not sepsis. That is what I wish to share with you at this stage. Okay, this baby on day 25 came with irritability, poor feeding, had uneventful delivery, was born without any risk factors, was exclusively breastfed. And uh, the baby didn't seem to be gaining weight despite being exclusively breastfed. One past hospitalization for excessive crying, irritability, and 
five days they got fed up there was no relief but the mother was used to say the uh, baby cries cries and cries a lot and obviously a diagnosis of colic was made by two other colleagues of hers and an anti colic medicine was prescribed the baby appeared to be alert active had good tone cry and activity and hepatosplenomegaly what was of concern to me was there was no gain in fact weight loss which was happening in this baby who was extremely irritable to an extent that uh, we thought that whether we should be doing a csf in this baby and uh, as the baby was placed in front you find that uh, despite the crankiness what was striking was there was positive movement of the left upper limb telling us that there was a monoparesis which was here which was uh, quite striking and then the mother said something which clinched the diagnosis the baby used to howl a lot when the baby was being lifted up but became quiet when left alone this is quite unusual in the newborn that the baby gets crying uh, which gets triggered when the baby is left uh, lifted telling us that there was a significant generalized systemic bony disorder which we were looking at and obviously uh, it was something which was beyond a bacterial sepsis the hepatosplenomegaly and the clinical course uh, made us suspect uh, that this was uh, we were dealing with a non bacterial sepsis a uh, vdrl of the mother was done which came strongly positive which got reflected also in the baby a csf study was done and it confirmed that we were dealing with congenital syphilis the clue here was a absence of risk factors and b a baby worsening when the baby got lifted up but becoming quite well when the baby was kept down the monoparesis is very huh? classical and uh, there are many conditions where you get a dramatic response in fact, and the, is, is, the moment you are on penicillin or the baby uh, monoparesis disappears so uh, this was a congenital syphilis that uh, almost gave us uh, what you can say unusual diagnosis and another baby who uh, at 12 hours of uh, age was admitted for respiratory distress and lethargy there were no risk factors by day 7 the hypoglycemia was persistent and the baby didn't seem to be improving in fact the glucose infusion rate continued to be on the higher side so why was this baby who was otherwise uh, having no risk factors for sepsis going on to develop refractory hypoglycemia and uh, the clue came when the blood culture on day 3 day 4 isolated an e coli what happens is that you have now two and two things put together it is an underlying metabolic cause of galactosemia which is there striking at you and uh, obviously uh, urine for reducing non reducing substances and a uh, urine for ketones must be performed in all sick newborns uh, uh, to pick up a uh, baseline clue to say that this is beyond sepsis this was another baby 36 weeks of age 1.9 kg uneventful delivery with worsening tachypnea since birth the baby went on to develop refractory hypoxia and went on to uh, need uh, mechanical ventilation and over last 6 days continued to be hooked on to the ventilator sepsis screen blood culture then twice came negative and in fact we thought that we were dealing with a severe or a drug resistant pneumonia we shifted over to a second line of antibiotics and were thinking whether we were dealing with a third line and the x ray was quite striking still at the end of day 7 what we had was a white out of the lung which was there now at such stage uh, when you say that this is a non responding pneumonia we said are we missing on something and there the diagnosis was picked up by a 2d echo which showed that we were dealing with a tapvc like mal rotation the another chamelon like disease in newborn is a tapvc and it can mimic and any kind of disorder it comes as a cyanotic heart it can come as a chronic lung disease or it could come just with failure to thrive and here uh, the message that we learned was that when you need to change the antibiotic twice rather consider changing the diagnosis and uh, this was another baby a uh, 36 week 2 kg with respiratory distress and shock with e coli sepsis obviously uh, uh, being uh, diagnosed Uh, but the point was that we were almost uh, in the second week of life and the baby continued to be drowsy over the last 24 48 hours the baby's parameters were stable the baby appeared little pale there was mild ictus and there was nothing otherwise going wrong with this baby 
So what was it that caused it was causing this baby? A repeat CSF was done, thinking that whether uh, we had missed on a meningitis, which came normal, and electrolytes, basic workup again didn't show anything except that we had an isolated low thrombocytopenia. The clue came here by looking at the urine, where budding high fever isolated. The baby uh, obviously had gone into uh, an urea by now over the last 12 hours, and uh, uh, an ultrasound picked up uh, bilateral uh, fungal balls in the kidney. And what we were dealing with was an obstructive uropathy secondary to fungemia. Amphotericin B was started within 48 hours. There was a marked relief in terms of establishment of urine output and the antifungals were uh, continued. The point here is any late onset thrombocytopenia with an unexplained thrombocytopenia, probably a possibility of late on sepsis, sepsis is being considered. And especially if we have a baby on seven days or more of antibiotics, please think in terms of fungemia, which is quite uh, common, not rare, simply because it is a treatable uh, and has uh, good uh, results. And lastly, I'm sure you have seen such babies. These are coming sometimes during the end of first or second week in the first month of life. They come with uh, fever, excessive crying, irritability, and what is common to all these babies is thrombocytopenia and you have this hyperpigmentation uh, which is there. And the clue here comes not from uh, doing a, a sepsis screen or a blood culture which don't give you any result. The clue is just observing and you also have noticed what is striking at all these babies is hyperpigmentation uh, in and around the face of the nose which is diagnostic. And you ask how is the mother and the mother also has suffered from similar illness what you are looking at here is chikungunya a viral illness which comes in epidemics and uh, something which is a hallmark for these and lastly this was a baby who uh, was admitted now for the third time with us with sepsis the first admission uh, uh, was for seven days the second admission was for another seven days and on day and this was the third time and what was common was that for last two admissions, there was always a high count. The baby otherwise relatively got stabilized quickly, but the WBC count always remained high. And uh, this made us think that uh, which is this sepsis which is going on for one month uh, where the cultures are sterile, the clues are not there on clinical examination. The clue came from our history where the mother uh, on specific inquiries told us that there was delay uh, of the umbilical cord. What we had here was a clue to an immunological disorder in the form of an LAD deficiency where hyperleukocytosis is the rule, almost a condition uh, which gets treated as sepsis. And uh, obviously, if we are dealing with a refractory sepsis, two things that should strike us is, are we dealing with a non-bacterial infection? And two non-bacterial infections that we must commonly think of is A, fungemia, and B, torch group. And lastly, an immune disorder is uh, or not much on our horizons, but whenever we make a diagnosis of sepsis, the differential diagnosis must say, is it a heart disease? Is it a non-bacterial infection? And thirdly, is it a uh, immunological disorder? And obviously, uh, inborn error of metabolism, which are uh, uh, there that we need to think of. And uh, this is time and again where you have such uh, babies uh, in the nursery where the pneumonia seems to be worsening, a new patch appears, a, a new uh, hyperlucency is what is noticed. But what we forget is the baby is clinically stable. And what here is being uh, mimicking here is that uh, this shift of mediastinum or uh, asymmetry of uh, lucency or appearance of a patch is simply because of a mal-rotated x-ray. And therefore, always interpret what the radiologist tells us that do a clinical correlation before you intervene for any of these reports. So what was the messages that we learned when we were dealing with any unwell infant? If there are absence of risk factors, uh, think beyond sepsis. If you have an atypical symptom or an abrupt deterioration, think of a non-bacterial uh, sepsis. If you have to change the antibiotic twice, ask yourself, uh, is it really sepsis? And uh, which is this sepsis, which is refractory sepsis? So probably you are dealing with a non-infective uh, cause. And anything which is going beyond 
few days, seven days or so, it is not likely to be a bacterial infection and it's going to be a non-bacterial kind of picture. And last but not the least, an abnormal reports in a normal baby is a commonest sepsis mimic, an iatrogenic in condition that is what uh, we need to keep in mind. And uh, uh, it is said that uh, I see what the mind knows and mind is like a parachute. It works best when kept open. So next time you make a diagnosis of sepsis, I urge you to make a differential diagnosis. The longer your differential diagnosis, the longer would be your thinking uh, ability and always ask, why did this baby develop sepsis? That becomes a triggering point to you to think of sepsis mimics. Thank you very much for your uh, patient listening and I would be happy to take questions if any. Uh, thank you, Rishi. As usual, you touched the clinical base and uh, uh, we are all 